It is the most time-honored two and a half miles in motorsports. A palette of gray framed by a multicolored wall of hats and shirts rising from a foundation of brick and reaching toward the blue Indiana sky. A track treasured and measured not for its miles, but its milestones. This morning, race drivers, race teams, and race fans all woke up with the same realization. Today, we race at Indy. And now the Walmart starting grid for today's Brickyard 400. Tony Stewart, Rushville or Columbus, Indiana, considers both hometowns alongside Bill Elliott on the front row. On the inside of road two is Dale Earnhardt Jr., who last year at collision on pit road cost him a chance at victory. And Robbie Gordon on the outside. Another Indiana boy, Ryan Newman from South Bend, will share row three with Steve Park, coming back from the terrible crash at Pocono last week. There's Kevin Harvick and Sterling Marlin in row four. Marlin, the championship leader, the second place man in points, Mark Martin, starts the position behind him in row five with Joe Nemechek. On the inside of row six, Johnny Benson, a driver who finished third last year and runs very well at this racetrack. Mike Skinner and Michael Waltrip, the Daytona 500 winner, share row number seven. Jimmy Spencer and John Andretti, a couple of Dodgers in row eight. Dale Jarrett's won the Brickyard 400 twice, 1996 and 99. He's back in row number nine with Matt Kenseth. There's Ward Burton along with Todd Bodine. In row number 10, Ward, the winner of this year's Daytona 500. And Jeff Gordon, 31 years old today. He's back in row number 11. He came from 27th to win here last year. He starts 21st today. On the inside of row 12 is Jeff Burton. Let's talk to him on our NBC radio. Jeff Burton, Benny Parsons. How's the car? Well, Benny, we were real fast on new tires. Uh, we thought we were giving up a little too much on old tires. So we made some changes this morning, trying to make the Cinco Taurus go really good on a long run. I suspect you'll see a lot of long runs today, and we needed to be better there. So I hope we made the right changes. Uh, like I said, we were just too fast to start, so we had to give up something, and we're going to give some of that up, hoping to get it at the end. This is the same car you used last week at Pocono, correct? We didn't test this car here, but we ran so well with it at Pocono that we decided to bring it, and uh, it's been good. It's, uh, it's not been great, but it's been good. As good as my guys are, I'm sure we got some good stuff under it. Try to get this thing to the front. Good luck to you, Jeff. Jeff Burton, who will take the green flag for the Brickyard 400 in row number 12. While you look at the rest of the starting grid, let's mention four drivers will have to drop to the rear on these pace laps. You can see them top right of your picture. They are Mike Skinner, Jeff Green, Bobby Hamilton, and Mike Wallace. All made engine changes. That's a violation of NASCAR's one engine per weekend rule. That means you've got to start at the back of the pack. Obviously, Mike Wallace starting last already. He's not really giving up a lot. He doesn't have to go too far. Seven drivers failed to qualify. The Brickyard 400, there they are. And as the field comes off of turn number four, this time they will see the one to go signal. Next time by the green away, let's check down on pit road for some final stories. And we begin with Marty Snyder. Alan, it's already been a very long day for Kevin Harvick, who woke up at 6 a.m. this morning feeling very ill, went to the infield care center. Turns out Kevin has food poisoning. Spent some time in there. They rehydrated him. He does feel much better. But I asked him, do you have a backup driver for today? And he laughed. He said, are you kidding me? It's the Brickyard 400. There's no way anybody's getting in my car today. Matt Yoakum. Marty, as a little kid, Jimmy Johnson dreamed of one day following the footsteps of A.J. Foyt, Gordon Johncock, and Rick Mears walking from Gasoline Alley underneath the Gasoline Alley Arch out to Pit Road to his race car. He accomplished that today, saying, proving he can even get goosebumps when it's 105 degrees. Now he's trying to win the race. He was a second and a half off the lead cars in happy hour. They've closed that to about half a second. Chad can ask them they're gambling on that last half second. His car owner, Jeff Gordon, won from 27th last year. They're trying to break that today and win from 37. Dave Burns. Matt right behind him in 38th will start Kurt Busch. He had a spin in his qualifying lap and he had to take a provisional starting spot. I asked him this morning what it meant to start at the Brickyard 400 and he said, "It's I don't want anything to go wrong. I just want everything to go smoothly. This is so big. Last year, he, he qualified 34th and finished 5th, so he passed a lot of cars. And today's his birthday, but they didn't make him his favorite cake. It's an ice cream cake and they didn't want to go there in this weather. Marty? 
Dave, I'll take some ice cream because the temperature out here is smoking. It's very hot here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Let's check the temperature on the ground. And you take it about one inch off the racing surface. 134.5 is the temperature on the racing surface. The drivers will have to combat the heat today. That was a big subject in the garage area this morning. How to stay cool for drivers. Many drivers started hydrating on Thursday, getting fluids in their bodies so they won't get too hot inside the car today. Alan? You know, it's not just a thing for the drivers either. It's for the crews as well because they're on pit road under the almost the same intensity the drivers are under, although it may not be quite as hot inside the, the pit area, but these guys with those thick uniforms, it's going to be a miserable day for them. It's really hard to get air in these cars. You've got the side window here at Indianapolis, and there's just no air that gets into them. So it's going to be an issue today. There's no doubt about it. And that track temperature, 135 degrees, that's probably going to go up. So it's going to be brutal. A lot of these driver's seats are right over the header, so you're going to get a lot of heat there. The winner's share of that $7 million purse is a little bit over $300,000 plus bonuses that can be won. You see it'll take 160 laps to make up the 400 miles. And the big number, you see the pit windows down the bottom, some teams feel they can get to 40 laps on fuel. But if they can, that means they're going to cut out a pit stop. So that could be important. Better than 275,000 fans have been coming into the Indianapolis Motor Speedway since before sunup today. They've all come to see whose name goes on the bricks at the end of the day as the winner of the ninth Brickyard 400. Tony Stewart is on the pole. Bill Elliott is alongside. The fans come to their feet. The pace car heads for pit road, and we are ready to start the ninth running of the Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis. Here they come to the green. Stewart last night was very upset with his car. Almost contact between he and Bill Elliott as Elliott tried to get to the bottom of the racetrack in turn one. Those guys know they, that's what they have to do. They need to get to the bottom, especially on these first few laps. The bottom lane is going to be the fast lane. This first lap always especially tense at Indianapolis. Looks like they're two, three wide down the back stretch. Martin Martin on the inside of Sterling Marlin as both of them try to get game on Steve Park. Bobby Gordon wide. Here's Dale Earnhardt Jr. for third. Ryan Newman goes by Robbie Gordon, takes the spot away. Tony Stewart will lead lap number one. Bill Elliott settles into second. Dale Earnhardt Jr. third on the break. Then Ryan Newman and Rob Gordon. And you've got Kevin Harvick, Mark Martin, Steve Park, Johnny Benson, and Sterling Marlin. And here comes Bill Elliott. The talk in the garage here this morning. The nine car he is the class of the field. But can he keep it together for 400 miles? He did last week for... 475 miles of Pocono. Matt, what do you what did you hear about the nine car? Well, Benny pulling a number of crew chiefs like you did this morning. They all point to the nine car as the one to beat. But I talked to Mike Ford, Bill's crew chief. He said their car is extremely fast on the short run. Where they've tried to improve the car is on the long run because it falls off too quickly. And the other weakness that Bill Elliott's team may have today is fuel mileage. Remember last week, if you were with us on our broadcast from Pocono, another big, flat, two-and-a-half-mile track. They had to pit earlier than everyone. If the race goes green for a long time, that shortage of fuel mileage might hurt Elliott's chances today. If someone can run 40 laps on a tank of fuel, they can make this race on three stops. Another driver, Bill Elliott, we know cannot do that. He will have to stop four times. Comes Jeff Gordon. You see, trying to get on the inside of Ward Burton. That's back for 15 to 16, maybe. Well, Jeff Gordon's made a great march toward the front. We've been struggling with Chevrolets all year on getting the front ends to stick good, and uh, we finally found a combination that got the Chevrolet as good as we were going to get it to stick, and uh, he felt real, real good about that. Gave him a feel the front end was pinned good. Really good behind Tony Stewart. He's not getting any of that arrow push that we've been talking about.
not so much yet. The key here is if you can keep the car down on the bottom, especially when you get right in the middle of the corner, and you can pull up beside somebody in the short shoot, that's where you're going to do a lot of your passing. From this point off out, and you can turn underneath somebody, you've got a really good race car. Elliot's hanging real well. And arrow push is a term the racers use a lot at a racetrack that's fast like this. Aerodynamic push. 20 cars going through the air. We see Bill Elliott trying to get alongside. The 20 cars going through the air, and the air does not come back on the nose of the 9 car like it would if he was by himself. So, therefore, he's not getting the downforce that he needs on the front of that car to push it down and aid the car in turning. Aerodynamically aid the car in turning. So, therefore, they called it an aerodynamic push or shortened it to arrow push. You see they've put a pretty good gap on third place Dale Earnhardt Jr., Stewart, and Elliott have. Got it by about uh, 1.9 seconds. Last time to went by the start-finish line. Here's Mark Martin starting to work on Robbie Gordon. That'd be for fifth place. Martin in the six, Gordon in the 31. Robbie ran the Indianapolis 500-mile race at this track back in May. Wow, look at Mark close on him. Yeah, he yeah. got off the four real well. A terrific run on Robbie Gordon. And there's nothing Robbie Gordon can do except when he gets to the corner, back off and let that six car go, pull in behind him. And hope that he might slip up the hill, get off the throttle, and you can pass it back. It did not happen with Mark Martin. This race could be important on Mark if he can gain some points back on Sterling Marlin. Again, referring back to last week at Pocono, Marlin's team had an electrical problem, had to stop and change a battery, and he lost about 51 points in the championship to Sterling. He was only 55 behind going in, so he doubled his deficit to the leader. Checking on Jeff Gordon, three-time Brickyard 400 winner. He's working on Matt Kenseth in the 17, and Matt's running 17th. Car Matt Kenseth. That's another name the crew chiefs talk about when they talk about a fast car. So we are clearly through the opening seven laps of the ninth running of the Brickyard 400. Tony Stewart is the leader. Got us a nice little duel for the race lead. Yeah, he's been on Star BP. He's been working on him. And what we talked about earlier, see how he cut underneath him getting off the corner? You get on the inside, that's the place to be. Yeah, with Bill, he's he's a veteran. He's very experienced. He's not going to do anything crazy uh, at the beginning of the race. And, you know, he was feeling Tony out and seeing what he had. And actually, you know, when Tony took the lead back, Wilson, he's got a pretty strong race car. Oh, there's trouble. Brett Bodine and Mike Wallace off turn two. Caution. First caution of the race. They were running 39th and 40th, respectively. Oh, Brett's got another car on fire. Another car on fire. He's trying to get the thing started. That was the uh, fire out the exhaust on that car and heavy damage to Mike Wallace's car. Mike driving for A.J. Foyt in that number 14. Got the very last starting spot in the field. Hit the uh, softer barrier. Looks like just off the exit of two there. That'd be the first one, right? Yeah. First yeah. start car. First there start car. No, no crashes in any of the testing that was held here over the last month. No crashes in Friday's practice or yesterday's practice in qualifying. We just about peeled the sheet metal of the skin off the 11 car. Obviously, you can see that. And there's the impact. Safer barrier, steel and foam energy reduction. Hopefully cushioning the blow for uh, whichever of the two hit the outside wall, if not both of them. Now, that's inconclusive. The crash had already started. Now, what caused it to start? See Ted Musgrave going by, Bobby Hamilton, the 55 car. 
And Kenny Wallace, another shot. Ooh, Mike Wallace just went straight right. Yeah, he was coming off a two there. Red Boat Iron makes the left turn into the garage. There you see the track officials inspecting the foam behind that barrier to make sure no repairs are needed. And Pit Road is going to get busy. That's amazing. I'll tell you what, these pits look a lot more now than they was on that EA Sports deal. <laughs> oh, they do, don't they? Just 11 laps complete and almost the entire field is in. Matt? Bill Elliott comes in the pit road in the second position. A gas and go only for Bill Elliott. He was extremely happy with his race car. Meanwhile, the six, he wanted to tighten up his race car. A half around a bite is to Snyder. Tony Stewart with a two-tire change, and he races his way off pit road. Got a fresh water bottle. No chassis adjustments for the leader. See Jeremy Mayfield back changing right sides on his car. And he will join the parade as all these cars exit pit road. We talk about strategy differences there. Wow. Two tires, four tires, no tires. And you wonder why all these cars would pit just 12 laps into the race. Dave, what's happening with the Jimmy Johnson car? Well, he had to pit, Benny, because of a couple of problems. First of all, he was very, very tight. They pulled a spring rubber out of the left rear to try to fix that situation. But also, he was having a little trouble with his center rear view mirror. And so, under this caution, he wanted to slow down and see if he could affect some repairs on that to make sure he could see the guys behind him. Actually, he'd already passed eight, four, eight cars since the race started. So, really, he's more interested in the guys in front. I guess that all these guys are trying to figure out if 12 laps, now they might be able to make it on three more stops. Scramble. Dale Earnhardt Jr. First to get there. Ooh, looks like Tony just got him. Barely beat Bill Elliott, Robbie Gordon. A lot of blocking going on there already. Lots of blocking because they want to get that. And we see that Kevin Hart looks like he's on the inside of Ryan Newman and, we, and Bill Elliott about to lose another spot as Ronnie Gordon goes by. I guess that was Mark Martin on the inside of Ryan Newman. And Kevin Harvick trying to follow him through. Well, now Harvick says Newman's got the better jump down the straightaway. Sorry, Mark. And here comes Jeff Gordon blasting up through there on the inside of Steve Park and backs off in time. He does get in the back of the six car of Mark Martin. Steve didn't know uh, Jeff was there until the last second. He really pulled that car back to the right. Steve Park in the one car. And they saved for Ward Burton, too, in that black and gold Caterpillar car. He got knocked up out of the groove there in turn four and kept it off the wall. Tony Stewart for the lead on Dale Jr. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dale. Tony's car must be handling pretty well. He can put his hand out the window as he comes off the floor and says, thanks, a little wave. So Stewart out in front, Earnhardt Jr. second, Robbie Gordon did get by Bill Elliott for third. Elliott back to fourth. And you've got Ryan Newman in fifth. Some of the lead pack come through, checking on the championship leader, Sterling Marlin. He's back in 10th spot now. We eavesdropped on his communication with his pit crew just a moment ago. Stops. And you know, they talk about communication between the driver and the crew chief being so critical. I don't I don't think anyone there misunderstood what Sterling Marlin said. It's really <laughs> tight. Terrible, terrible. When you say do everything, yes. that's tight. What do you want to do? And you give you two options. Do them both. <laughs> Again, Marlin running back in 10th spot now. He started the race in eighth, so he's lost a couple of positions. His championship rival, Mark Martin, is running seventh. The impressive run for Jeff Gordon just in front of Marlon there, too, so far. And we 
saw where Gordon stood in relation to Marlon in the championship at this point in the race. You know, Jeff Gordon, those guys have been confident all week that their car was going to run okay. They, <laughs> you know, they tested. What, what you got on Jeff Gordon? And I'll tell you what, tell the folks what you don't tell them. Well, Benny, uh, you're exactly right. They were very confident. In fact, Jeff made it very clear after practice yesterday that he thought this car would race well. Tony Gibson said they made a small shock adjustment this morning before they rolled the car out on the grid. The car is very, 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 that's a quote, tight in traffic, especially when he's behind more than one car. But Jeff didn't want to make too many changes when they came in because he had been in so much traffic. It was two right side tires and fuel for the 24. You know, and they came up and tested a couple of weeks ago bought a brand new car and an old car, tested them, neither one of them ran well, so they brought back a third car, and they didn't run very well at Pocono with another car, so I thought they were struggling this weekend, but so far, it's not been that big a struggle for Gordon as he's in ninth spot. Jeff Gordon's record here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the Brickyard 400 is spectacular, to say the least. Check it out, Mark Martin, as he works on Kevin Harvick. Martin in the six, Harvick in the 29. There you see Gordon's numbers. Jeff working on Steve Park now for the eighth place. He's gotten up to ninth. And Junior in the eight car is starting to struggle. We saw Tony Stewart pass a little bit ago. Now Bill Elliott has gone by in the nine car. And Junior last time by was about three and a quarter seconds behind. The leader, he Tony Stewart. Just lost another spot. Going to lose another one yet. Wonder if there's something up there. He didn't take tires on his pit stop. But some of the guys he's racing with will be. Tony Stewart is the leader of the Brickyard 400. At the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, he's got 1.2 seconds on Bill Elliott. when they went back to green and has fallen all the way back to about 14th, 15th position. Marty, what's happening with Junior? Yeah, Benny, his descent through the field continues now actually back to the 16th position. And Junior has said nothing on the radio. They've asked him a couple times what's going on, and he has not responded. They can, they think the car continues to get tight. That was a problem last time. Again, they took no tires on that last time. Maybe that's a little bit of it. And there you go. Really, really, really tight. So Junior finally did respond. The car very tight for Dale Earnhardt Jr. He finally got a free spot in traffic where he could put that hand over onto the radio. <laughs> His hands full in all those cars. Yeah, these drivers really have a problem trying to talk to the crew Bristol. Yeah. Here's Rusty Wallace going to pass Dale Earnhardt Jr. and make it look easy. And he looks like he has a problem tight in. And obviously, if you're tight in, that is bad all the way through. But it looks like he's having a hard time getting the car turned in, especially into four and two. And you want to talk about somebody on the move. That Rusty Wallace started way back in 35th place. And he just took 16 from Dale Earnhardt Jr. Let's take a ride with Dale Jr. here and see if we can see what he's up against. Here he is, of course. He's going down the back straightaway right now. So we've got a few minutes. Yeah. He gets to the next corner. Five-eighths of a mile long, the straightaways are here at Indy. Okay, he's approaching turn three. Turns the car in. Well, it takes him a long time to get back to the throttle. Right there. It looks like the car doesn't stick too good. How fast was he going, DP? Right 190. You can see the red all the way up to about 196 miles per hour. Let's watch down the front straight away. Might be a little bit faster. Yes, 198 miles per hour as he enters turn one. And we can see a lot of movement in that hand to try to get the car to go to the left. And it looks like as soon as he picks the gas up, the front of the car starts sliding. And so it's, it's a power push, we call. As soon as you hit the gas, the front starts sliding, especially off the corners here, like we just saw. And you can see that Junior is hot in the car down the straightaway. He lifted his visor on his helmet to try to get a little bit of breeze in there. He stuck his fingers in there and maybe wiped some sweat off his brow, too, off his nose. But, you know, when you're looking at that, the hand movement isn't dramatic. 
as you look like it. For somebody who's never driven a race car like me, but what you're saying is the way he has to compensate for the car sliding the front end is staying off the gas. He should exactly. be back on the gas earlier. Exactly. If you keep staying on, if you go to the gas hard and you just don't lift, you're going to hit the wall. So when you go on the gas and the car starts to push, you just have to go down slower on that gas pedal and just kind of keep up with the grip that you're feeling through the steering wheel. The other guy I mentioned, Rusty Wallace, has moved up well from the back of the field. Right behind Dale Jr., here comes the 97, Kurt Busch. He started this race in 38th spot. Alan, I'm inside the No Boundaries Ford. Sorry, Wally, I had to take over the ride for you here. And it is hot. The lowest temperature I could find in here, about 108. And now you can see up on the dash area, it's about 150. There's action on the track. Got a crash. It's Kurt Busch with a hard crash. That's too bad. He was flying. He was running very, very well. Looks like he might have tested that safer barrier one more time. He was in 17th place at the time of the accident. After starting the race back in 38. Oh. Boy. He has pounded the wall with the left side of that board. And great news there. Oh, he's mad at somebody. Yes, he is. He's hot. angry at somebody. I think he's got his weapon. Oh, no, it's his hat. <laughs> he's going down and just tell somebody when they go by that he's angry. All right. Survey says. <laughs> Who is he racing with there? We're here, and it's a red car. Jimmy Spencer? Yeah. That would be, what, the third or fourth time this year that they've tangled? Remember Bristol. You see, there goes Spencer. Off turn four. We talk about Bristol. <laughs> There's Kurt Busch. He was the winner at Bristol. But let's go back this spring in April. Spencer makes a little contact with Kurt Busch, gets on the inside, takes the lead, just a few laps to go. Kurt Busch goes down in turn one. Says, okay, Jimmy. Out of the way you go, I go by and win the Bristol race. Spencer almost wins. And they've made contact a couple of more times since then on the racetrack, too. Because it was at Phoenix. Didn't that last that year? The start yeah. of it last yeah. year yeah. at Phoenix. At well, the very top of the screen, Kurt pushes on the inside of Jimmy Spencer. Down that long straightaway, Kurt moves over to get some air between the two cars. Get to turn three. He just booted him out of the way. Wow, that's not good. No. I mean, here you got a guy coming. Okay, he passed him clean. And you can see the car was slowing up in front of him. I don't think Kurt's going to let that one go over too easy. <laughs> Leaders come to pit road. Stops will be as they complete lap 37. And we go to Bill Weber. It'll be four tires, no changes on the 24, which starts up tight but gets freer. But a problem inside the car. Gordon's oil pressure gauge is broken. It is taped to the max. They told him, don't worry about it. It's not the gauge. The tires look very worn coming off this car. Matt? Bill Elliott, second on the scoring pile on, second on the screen. No chassis, just for the nine. Bill said the car was a little bit free and open air, but then the car was a little bit tight when he got close to other cars. They're putting on scuffs, Marty. Ryan Newman on the bottom of your screen in the third position. The car is tied in one and two. They did make a wedge adjustment. He is fine in three and four. Tony Stewart, four tires and no changes, and Stewart will keep the lead as he wins the race off pit road. A great stop for Bill Elliott, 14.5. Well, I don't know. I want to check that camera in our line at the end of pit road. Ah, Bill Elliott got him. Give it to Bill Elliott. By about three feet. And by the way, Kurt Busch has been invited to have a visit to the big red truck for his on-track demonstrations. I, th I think one was okay. Another one was not. So was the NASCAR maybe? <laughs> yeah. The NASCAR officials want to have a little chat with him in the principal's office after I, the race. I've been over. invited there a couple times. I'll bet you have.
Well, Kurt Busch has just stepped out of the infield care center. Kurt, what do you think happened out there? Oh, just been having troubles with turn three this weekend. In qualifying, we spun, and that put us in a bad position back there with the decrepit old has-beens, I guess. It's just been a tough way. I mean, when he calls out what he's going to do and then actually goes out there and does it, uh, I mean, I guess he's a never was is really the term that we need to bring up today. But uh, real unfortunate, we had the car to beat. We were going to the front. Rubbermaid, very sorry about it. We'll go back and work at it next week. I mean, it's, it's tough when you bump somebody at 100 miles an hour and then when they come back and bump at 200 miles an hour. So if, if that's the way that Jimmy Spencer is, we know how he is, and we're not going to play like that. Hi, Kurt, I want to ask you one more question regarding the safer barrier. You oh, yeah, hit it. How did that feel? You're the tester. Yeah, I was the first one to test it out. I'm, I'm okay. I guess uh, it did its job. I knew it was going to be a hard hit. I braced myself. Um, you know, the lessons that we learned as far as uh, Dr. Melvin and the things that he's implemented with us, it's great that I can walk away from a wreck like that, backing it at a 200-mile-an-hour rate. What did it feel like, Kurt? It, it felt bad. I mean, there's just there's nothing that you can say that would describe exactly what happens except for standing in the boxing rink and having a heavyweight just knock you upside the head. All right, that's what happened to Kurt today. We're back going green, Alan. Bill Elliott, now the leader, and his crew got him the advantage over Tony Stewart on the exchange of pit stops. I guess that's pretty fair, just a heavyweight. I think it's a heavyweight, two heavyweights in the ring with you from both sides at the same time. I, I think one thing we've established clearly from Bristol to today, he's got us a little feud going. Yeah, I think you are right. Kevin Harvick, 29 car, looking to get a spot from his teammate, Robbie Gordon, out of the fourth place. I'll tell you what, Robbie keeps throwing those blocks. That's going to catch up with them here. Matt Kenseth from the 17, looking to follow through. If they hang him out like that, there's going to be a lot of guys who are going to get through. Especially if they line up on the straightaway and draft by him. Kenseth is through, here comes Mark Martin in the 6, and what, about a dozen, 15 cars, all in a line too. Here's Dale Jarrett. Martin Martin goes down to block Jarrett to make sure he doesn't get on the inside and make it three wide. Well, Robbie Gordon's going to turn left in a minute. He's going to get frustrated with all these guys going by, and he's just going to have to turn left and try to get back in line. And the big brown truck moves up the spot. Okay, it's a call. He doesn't want to race the truck. He want to race the truck. The hair I was talking about, these guys are lining up right now. And Robbie's going to have a, a tough time getting down that little line. Also, it's a little bit dirtier up there. Although he may get a break here, no, Sterling decided he's going to go back down with Rusty. But it's hard to turn back down. It looks like you say you can be clear. Rusty gave him a break there, but it's hard to just turn down to the bottom of the racetrack. Jeff Gordon running in ninth place. We eavesdropped on his communications with his team a moment ago. He was talking with him about how his car is handling in traffic. I think it started out tight those first uh, three, four, five laps, something like that, them right sides, right? That's 10-4. Did the tightness stay in it, or did it kind of come out? I know you kind of get, kept getting that cleaner air there. Um, you know, it, in clean air, it wasn't bad, but uh, it stayed fairly tight. You know, it just depends on how close I am to other cars. And, you know, at the beginning of those runs, even though the tires are new, I'm right behind them, other guys. 10-4. It's Robbie Loomis, the crew chief, back and forth with Jeff Gordon on the radio. Todd Bodine, the Discover 26 car, on the inside of Jimmy Spencer. He's 15th place, he made the pass for. And we see Tony the Tiger trying to get on the inside of Steve Park. That's the five car. Watching Jimmy Spencer here and talking about an on-track feud between he and, and Kurt Busch. What's NASCAR's role in stopping this and settling it? Well, do they let it play out and let, let you know, the wild, wild west, justice will take care of itself, or do they have to do something and step in here and say, okay, enough's enough? My guess is that they've got to step in. If it's, again, this is a, we had an incident in Bristol back in the spring. Nothing has really happened since then. Uh, this is just another incident. I think right now that probably nothing will happen, but if something were to happen next week or in the next month or so, they got to step in and do something. Well, I'm surprised they didn't step in there. I mean, that's what you call getting booted, getting in a turn three. 
So I don't know. You know, it, it, I don't know where you're going to say you draw the line. The line should have been drawn today, but it wasn't. So you're right. How far does it go? That's up to NASCAR. But as far as I'm concerned, Kurt Busch is sitting in the infield right now because he got punted. The thing I wanted to do is I wanted to get off sequence of the leaders and every, the rest of the field as soon as possible. You, you know, if they take two or four or whatever, I want to get on an opposite cycle as them, try to get the car up front and then get back on that cycle. And that's what we did. We had taken two tires early on, got a little bit of track position. Everybody else had taken four tires. We came back in on the next stop when everybody was going to take two and took two again so we could get back on cycle with them and then stay on that cycle for the rest of the day. Jimmy Johnson around Jimmy Spencer, pick up 18th place. Bobby Lottie continuing to move forward. He'll be the next one to work on Spencer. Bill Elliott trying to put some distance on Tony Stewart and the rest of the field. We are past 100 miles in the Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Caution is out for a third time in the Brickyard 400. Jeffrey Bodine has crashed hard. That is in turn number two. You see the safety workers already there at Bodine's car, the 1986 Daytona 500 winner. Look at the damage on the back end of the car. We see him hand his helmet to one of the safety workers. You know, the amazing thing is that was that was fantastic. Those guys were there about the time he stopped. These guys are the best. These guys are the best in Indianapolis on getting to a wreck. We're trying to pick him up right here. It looks like he just he gets is. loose, getting right through that corner there. BB just got loose getting in. He goes up, hits the outside wall. Boom. And it really comes across and hits the inside wall probably harder than he hit the outside, it seems like. Bang. Wow. Listen to this. Look at a right rear wheel on that thing. And watch. Wow. Another chance for these guys to make these adjustments and try to get these cars better and better. See if they can do anything about catching Bill Elliott or Tony Stewart. Whoever coming to you. Well, they weren't. Jeff Gordon was staying out until uh, he radioed in, said they're coming. Robbie said, so are you. So here's Gordon, whose car, as we heard, is tight early, but gets better. No tires, it's only fuel. The former Indy winner is on his way down pit road. Well, we wanted to make sure that we got fuel in the car and uh, was on equal fuel with the leaders. We were going to have 12, 13 lap distance on tires, but we felt like being on an equal fuel window with them was real important. It'll be a two-tire stop for Harvick. Fuel only for Tony Stewart. And Bill Elliott and Tony Stewart nearly collide on pit road. Elliott has to go out onto the racetrack and avoid the access road as other cars scatter everywhere, trying not to wreck, leaving pit road. Yeah, what's going on there, Marty? Because the accident and the safety workers are on the pit exit road between turns one and two, the NASCAR stop-and-go paddle man is trying to tell them to go up onto the racetrack. See the official there? Bill Elliott is trying to win his first Brickyard 400, third here twice, trying to win his third crown jewel event. He told his crew chief, Mike Ford, the car is a little bit free in open air, but the car is tight in traffic, so they chose to only take on fuel with that last stop. They only had 16 laps on that set of tires. To make judgment calls come the end of the race on, on the information you gathered through uh, who took no tires, who took two tires, who took back. Uh, you know, we tried fuel a couple times to keep our track position when we didn't have many laps on our tires, and that worked out. A lot of people did that as well. Uh, two tires really didn't seem to work out well for a lot of guys early in the race, so that wasn't a concern at all for us. Rusty Wallace had a tight race car. When he put that number two car into the turns, it wanted to push up toward those safer barriers more than Rusty wanted. He came in for a pit stop, took on four tires, filled it full of fuel, and made a track bar adjustment to fix the tight condition. Alan? Dale Earnhardt Jr. came in for a second time on his caution flag for an extended stop, so he's all the way back in 37th position as the field got the one-to-go signal. John Andretti peeled off the pit, so now Bill Elliott has reassumed the top spot. What a drive for Rusty Wallace today. He 
started back in 30th place, and he's up to 21st so far. And you heard that he still doesn't have the car the way he wants it. Let's talk about heat for a second, Wally. We saw Dave inside our Ford No Boundaries car showing what the temperature was in that car that's not even out on the track at full speed. Yeah, you can add another 10 or 15 degrees to that temperature, which I can't, uh, was it 153 or 154, 154 Dave was yeah. showing us, something like that. So, yeah, these cars are, are really hot right now. And and uh, another problem with the ice is uh, you have to tape those Ziploc bags shut because... Nine out of ten times, the ice will spill all over the bottom of the car on the handoff from the team to the driver. So, real important. And you see the heat, in it, heat index today, 102 degrees. And, and, you know, that water spilling on the floor of the car, that boils. Yes, quickly. Yeah, so that's that's a problem. All right, we're set to go back racing. Bill Elliott is the leader after John Andretti peeled off. Tony Stewart, Matt Kenseth, Jeff Burton, Mark Martin. Gee, a little Roush flavor there to that top five. Kenseth, Burton, and Martin all driving for the cat and the hat. And as we see, Jimmy Howell waves the green flag, gets these guys back on the way, and Robbie Gordon quickly goes down to try to block, and Harvey drives by, tries to drive by both of them on the outside. Now that was a gutsy try by Harvey. Not done yet. To Richard Childress Racing teammates, door to door. Tell you what, tempers are going to flare, though, if you keep doing that on every single restart on those blocks. Believe me, these guys don't want that. Tony Stewart with a look inside. Bill Elliott for the lead. We, in the beginning, I think we raced up to eighth or ninth spot before our first pit stop, and um, we just we kind of stayed and, and did what the leaders did. We all sort of did the same thing. If we had less than 10 or 12 laps in our tires, we came in and just got fuel, and uh, if we had more than that on our tires, we came in and got four tires. So we never did two tires all day. We either got got four or just got fuel, and uh, that seemed to keep up with our track position pretty decent. Doug Gates, the Robert Gates' son, told me this morning in the garage here, this 88 car is really good today. Expect him to be up front when the race is over. Two-time winner here at Indianapolis. That's Dale Jarrett. Jeffrey Bodine treated and released from the infield medical center. After that hard crash, good news there. South Bend, Indiana's Ryan Newman running just ahead of Dale Jarrett. A 12 car, 24 years old. Engineering graduate from Purdue University. You know, so much talk about Tony Stewart and Jeff Gordon being the Indiana boys when we come back to the Brickyard, but here's a kid who came here last year, made his Winston Cup debut at this racetrack, qualified fifth, and was running third when he bumped the wall, knocked the uh, suspension of his car out of alignment, and he wound up fading back into the field. He wants to win here. You're right, he does want to win, so he obviously wants to go up and catch these guys and go past Bill Elliott for the lead. Right now, I think the bigger issue is can he keep Dale Jarrett, the 88 car, behind him? Again, Newman is in ninth, Dale Jarrett's 10th. We've got the 40 of Sterling Marlin there, the championship leader. He's in 11th. Kenny Wallace just on the pit road and off on the green flag. Vibration reported from his crew. Ryan Newman has gotten better and better as this season has gone on. I guess we call that the, the experience factor. I think that is experience. Working with his crew, with Matt Borland, the entire crew, learning more about these heavy stock cars, 3,400 pound cars. And when they talk, when he and his crew talk, here's a couple of guys with engineering backgrounds. They talk engineer speak. Yeah. As Chicago, I'll, not, I'll never forget him going in the corner and said, it's in y'all going in turn three. First time I'd ever heard that to explain loose. Yeah, that 12 car is handling really good on the straightaways right now. He pulled away from the 88 car straightaway. You don't see that too often. All right, well, let's see what kind of RPM and mile per hour that DJ might be turning down the front straightaway. We saw what, 198 before? 200, 201. 201 miles per hour. And you 
saw over 9,000 RPMs. There is a breeze blowing straight down the front straightaway, so we'll see more RPM and more mile per hour down the front stretch than we will the back. Looking ahead, Ryan Newman working on Jeff Gordon for eighth place. While Dale Jarrett is in the picture here, let's take a minute and say hi to Ned Jarrett, the Hall of Famer and two-time NASCAR champion. He's been under the weather a little bit lately. I understand he spent some time in the hospital and hope Ned's feeling better real soon. Yeah, Glenn was telling us last night over the NASCAR Bush Series race that Ned was in the hospital. So Ned, get well soon. Look at Blaney on the inside of Sterling Marlin. Marlin tried to block him. Blaney said, "Uh uh, I'm going on." Oh, look, guys, he's gonna be on the inside of Jeff. Oh, he slid up the track a little bit. Sterling taking a look on the bottom. Does he have enough? No. The Buckeye Bullet, Dave Blaney from Hartford, Ohio, former World of Outlaws street car champion. season of Winston Cup competition, high of a finish so far this year. Ninth place out of the California Speedway near Los Angeles. Starting today in 33rd, he's up to 11. Sterling tried putting the block on to Steve Park, but it was he successful? I guess it was successful. So far, I mean, he's tearing the body trying to get by. Bill Elliott and Tony Stewart have dominated the Brickyard 400 so far. We are 61 of 160 laps complete. Let's make our singular call to the pits. We'll go to Pit Road and Matt Yoakum. That one would be a major concern, not only on Pit Road, but also in the race car. Mike Ford asked his driver, Bill Elliott. Bill, how is the interior of the car? How are you doing? He says, Mike, I'm rather comfy in here. He hasn't said a whole lot. That means good. They can make it on two more stops. Also, the 17 car, Matt Kenson, trying to get some good luck here lately and also trying to get some good luck here at the Brickyard. If they stop, which they did, they can now make it on two more stops. Matt felt like this adjustment they just made should be good to help this race car stay up front and possibly win this race. Meanwhile, Mark Martin, best career finish here at their Brickyard, sixth. They first adjusted the wrong way on their first stop, and they battled back with wedge adjustment. This car was just too loose on entry. To Martin. Tony Stewart back in the fourth position. Matt, remember they took fuel only on their last stop. The car has been very good for Tony. A little bit loose at times, a little bit tight at times, and different corners of the racetrack depend on which way the wind is blowing. He says those are affecting his laps a whole bunch. Also behind him, Kevin Harvick. Remember, Kevin battling food poisoning today, a little bit sick in the car. The team asked him, how do you feel? He said, I feel fine. The car is great. Starts free at the beginning of a run. Gets a little bit tighter the later it runs. Three straight top tens for this team. Behind him is teammate Robbie Gordon. A little bit tight. Richard Children's on the radio said, be patient. We have a good car and we can win. These guys have had two top tens in the last three races, Matt. Dale Jarrett racing for points, but also for more pride and prestige. He's looking for another win in the Brickyard 400. On his previous stop, they made a wedge adjustment. On his last stop, just two tires of fuel. No changes on the 88 car, Martin. Ryan Newman thinking, thinking that uh, engineering talk that we were talking about just a little while ago. Currently running in the eighth position, just picked up a spot. A little while ago, he said, I'm three quarters tight. Now he says, I'm one and a half tight. That speak to his crew chief, Matt Borland, who's also an engineer, to say the car's getting tighter the longer he goes. Hey, what a great run for Dave Blaney running ninth. He started 33rd, and they haven't made hardly any changes on the car all day. On the last stop, they changed two right side tires. Bill? Jeff Burton changed four tires on his first stop, four tires on his second stop, but no tires on his most recent stop. That's why he's getting passed by a bunch of guys, including Sterling Marlin, who just goes around. Burton's in the 99 car. It's the same car that they ran last week in Pocono. Caution. Yeah, this is for debris on the racetrack, Bill. It'll be the fourth yellow flag of this Brickyard 400, and it'll come out at lap number 68. And we saw Jimmy Spencer in the middle of all that as we were going through our through the field, and there you see the debris on the racetrack. Spencer, during our commercial break, had a flat tire or something. I think it was a flat left side tire. Made an unscheduled pit stop and is now in a lap down. He thought it was flat, but it was not. Really? Tough mistake there. So Spencer's back in 38th place. 
Now everybody was just in at lap 52. Do they stop again? Oh, yeah. I think they're all coming. in. You think so? We just heard a lot of people say they can make it on two more stops. Not from here, though. No, they're going to have to stop. I think Jeff Ford is really in the pickle right now because he stopped and only gas only the last time, and he's fallen back to 13th. So I think that he's going to uh, probably, if, if any of these leaders pit, he will come in and get four times. Track position is so critical here. Bill Elliott looks like he's coming in. Who fakes and who goes? You don't want to give anything up on fuel. If you don't stop and the rest of the guys stop, that puts you short pitting the next time. And uh, it looked like a large number of guys were coming in, so we opted to come in, just top it off, so we didn't get out of sequence with the rest of the crowd. We'll go to Matt Yoko. Well, Alan, as the parade of cars hit up pit road, Bill Elliott, they're talking about no adjustments for the leader. He was extremely pleased with his race car. Meanwhile, Mark Martin, after finishing 35th back in 94, we left five straight top tens, but his last two finishes here, a 43rd and a 22nd, two tires, and a track bar adjustment for Mark Martin. Best finish here, six, trying to get Roush's first win at the Brickyard. Meanwhile, Matt Kenson, his teammate, the car that he partly owns, a half a pound out of the right rear, four tires, and fuel. Looks like Tony Stewart just got two tires on his stop. Green flag. Two guys who got just two tires on their stops include Jeff Gordon, who's up to seventh place up restart. Jimmy Spencer is trying to hang in there and get a lap back from the leader. Car is through that puts him on the tail of the lead lap. He is a full two and a half miles behind Tony Stewart, but if the caution comes out, the pace car gets in front of the leader. Spencer gets a free pass around back into contention. Robbie Gordon trying to peek out, take a look. Could he get Tony Stewart to go up the racetrack, get him the bottom? Did not work. <laughs> with his team last Saturday in Pocono after the final practice session of the day. He went over a jump on the bike and didn't make it all the way. The bike kind of bottomed out on the chassis. He injured his left heel, Marty, and he's got to be in some discomfort. He is in a little bit of discomfort, but he feels pretty good inside the race car, Alan, and he's wearing a special shoe that has aluminum in the bottom of the left heel, and that protects him, A, from the heat, from, from it swelling even more, and it also makes him feel a little more comfortable. So he's got that special shoe on. He has taken care of the ankle this week and is wrapped very tightly today so it won't swell anymore in the great heat they're experiencing inside these cars. Those, um, those cool little things that they unveiled, that the, it's almost like a personal scooter on two wheels. You stand on it with the hand over the rolls. He's getting all kinds of directions. Hey, Robbie had one of those in the garage this morning. That's how he was getting around here. That'd be the Segway. As hot as it was, the hottest the racetrack was, four tires was the way to go on that racetrack. The problem was you needed four tires and track position. We never gave Jeff that opportunity. We gave him four tires, but we never really had the track position. Jeff Burton, 99, Ryan Newman, 12, and Terry Labonte in the five. This is 12, 13, and 14. Jeff Burton's 99 car, obviously not as good as it was last week at Pocono. Great run for Terry Labonte. 31st to 5th in that five car. Two-time NASCAR Winston Cup champ. Really hasn't had a whole lot to get excited about this year. These guys didn't run that good at Pocono early either, though. No. I mean, you know, it took them three quarters of race. Steve Park in the one, moving up on Mike Skinner in the four. All right, here we go. Bill Elliott on the inside of Sterling Marlin. Takes that spot away. He's been able to get by Dave Blaney a couple laps ago. And you see the leader, Tony Stewart, has put Jimmy Spencer in the 41 car, a lap down again. Bad news for Tony Stewart. Here comes Bill Elliott. Should he expect any different? That's the way it's been all day. The two of them been up front. My right front fender, take a look at it next time, okay? Not like, not like Robbie Gordon there. Might have some damage to the right front. He's asking the spotters to take a look at it. Obviously, oh, thanks for maybe make contact with someone. Here goes Elliot. 
boy, he can just turn that ball under people off the corner, can he? That's what you got to have here. That, that is a perfect card in Indianapolis. Pretty strong nine car, Matt. Alan, when Mike Ford and the Dodge Boys were loading this race car to go to Pocono, Mike joked and said, if we go to Pocono and win the pole and win the race, we're going to have to take this car to Indy. Well, guess what? That's exactly what they did. So when the car got back to the shop, the team worked until almost 3 a.m. until Tuesday morning, stripping this car of the chassis components, taking it down to the bare metal. They worked all night or almost every night this week because this is the best car they felt like they had for Indy. A marquee event, a marquee event that they want to win for Dodge. They felt like they missed out on giving Dodge their first win back in Wichita Cup, but if Dodge has never won here at the Brickyard, we'd like to have that honor. Under caution in the Brickyard 400 for the fifth time, right at halfway, Jeremy Mayfield's car has gone up in smoke. And let's see who's coming to pit road and who's not. Almost everyone except the first three cars is coming down pit road. The deal with Indy is you don't want to get caught on fuel, and there's always a long green, which there wasn't this time, but uh, I was afraid of it, so that's why we stayed, tried to stay on top of the fuel, and we just uh, kept, if we had fresh tires on, we'd come on and just top it off and go again. Sterling Marlin last time, Bill, took two tires only. He was tight. Those two tires stopped, made him even tighter. This time they take on left side tires. The other tires only have seven laps on them, so in theory now they have four fresh tires. But just changing those two left sides, Sterling Marlin's going to lose a host of position that most guys, a lot of guys, you only that stuff. I don't wonder if plan on changing tires. I, um, I'm a little puzzled why you would not pit there if you are the leader. Because you're at 80 laps to go, 40 laps, 40 laps. I don't know. We'll follow up on that in a moment. Jeremy Mayfield coasting into the garage under caution number five in the Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis. Bill Elliott, Tony Stewart, Robbie Gordon, Ryan Newman, Todd Bodine, and Ricky Craven stayed on track. Those who did stop with a variety of pit strategies. I'm not curious why Elliott's team did not bring him in. Matt, got an answer for us? Well, I'm down here in the leader's pit. Mike Ford, how many laps shy of your window were you? Well, we were about nine laps short of our window. Really what did he say for us to pit and lose our track position, so we opted to stay out. This car loves to clean air, and if you go by their 35 laps, which Mike told me before the race started, they should have to pit somewhere around lap 105. Marty? Well, let's ask, ask Greg Zipidelli, so why did you guys not stop? I, we were talking, and uh, I didn't hear Tony say anything. Kind of assumed we were coming in, uh, talked over each other. It's, uh, I don't know, late clutches are falling here. Hopefully it won't be that big a deal. We're going to be close to trying to make it and, uh, you know, splitting this last segment in half. Um, People that just came in can do that probably now. Uh, it'll be close for them, so we'll just see what happens. He made that Tony's decision. There'll be 78 laps to go when we do get the green flag, guys. Most teams very close on whether or not they can split that in half, make it on one more stop. Well, obviously, Bill Elliott could not. We saw it poking on last week. Continually did not get the fuel mileage that some of the Fords and General Motors cars were able to get with this Dodge engine, so hey, he couldn't make it. Why stop? And in Tony's situation, there may have been just some confusion over the radio. He didn't see Bill come in. Everybody turned in behind him, but if you talk over each other on the radio, Tony may not have got the message, or Zippy didn't get the message. You see Tony Stewart and Bill Elliott have dominated the race today. Dale Earnhardt Jr. with an extra pit stop earlier. That's why he's back in 25th place. We were going racing this time, but the oil dry that's been spread on the track is a little too thick for the driver's liking. They're going to take an extra few laps to try and get that cleaned up. Elliott leaves. Tony Stewart is second. Robbie Gordon third. Ryan Newman is fourth. Michael Ryan is fifth. Ricky Craven is sixth. Those six cars did not stop under this yellow flag. Everybody else on the lead lap did. And there are 36 of the 43 starters still on the lead lap, past halfway here at Indianapolis. You see how he's leaving the car there. A lot of that's got to do with when you're under yellow, you pick up a lot of garbage on the tire. And after the restart, he felt he probably slipped the car in one and two. So he was leaving the car on the back straightaway to try to get all that rubber and debris off the tire before he got it to turn three. And it looked like he was trying to break the grab on Jimmy Spencer, but I agree with you that he was really through the trying to clear his tires. 
Robbie Gordon again with that block, this time on Ryan Newman. And Newman makes a late entry trying to get on the inside to get alongside Robbie Gordon. The short straight did not work. If that race goes green in track position, like I said, is so critical. You know, extra couple seconds in the pits, the straightaways the way they are, heck, that's half straightaway <laughs> behind. And uh, the cautions allowed us and a lot of other teams to make adjustments, like you said, and, and, and be able to be in position at the end. Without those cautions, it would have been really tough. We we probably pitted more than we should have. We talked about it a lot, not just today, but in all the races we've done this season, Betty. Track position is king in this sport anymore. It's everything. Tell us about Todd Bodine's day. Well, he's been battling a tight race car today, Alan, but the biggest thing he's been battling, like a lot of teams up and down pit road, the heat. In fact, the hottest item on pit road, Ziploc bags. They ran out of those PR individual, had to go to the catering booth behind pit road to get more Ziploc bags. So like Wally showed us at the beginning of the show, they can put ice in the bags, so you can slide inside his fire suit. And what that actually does, it actually keeps your heart cool. And it keeps your blood down, and I, I, or your blood cooler, and it helps tremendously. I mean, I know there's a lot into the cool boxes, cool suits, and things like that, but that simple bag of ice really works. You just got to keep replacing it. When it's as hot as it is today, you need it about every 15, 20 laps. Robbie Gordon working on Jimmy Spencer. That 41 car is the first one to lap down. He's in 37th place. That's going to hurt him there. He split up high, got that loose stuff. Newman got a real run on him. Talking about that loose up, some of the drivers were talking to me this morning about the new grooves that they, they diamond cut the surface of this racetrack to try to take all the bumps out of it. And the grooves go around the racetrack, and they felt like it was really taking grinding a lot of rubber off the tires. And that rubber obviously would accumulate just outside the groove. Three wide, back in traffic, Jeff Gordon slipping by both Dave Blaney and Mike Skinner. That puts Jeff up in the 18th place, Bill. And it has been a struggle for that team throughout most of the day. Last pit stop, they put on four tires because the pit stop previous, Jeff said two tires just do not work. With two tires, the car will not handle. So they put on four, made an air pressure adjustment, but he's back in traffic. And we learned early in this race, in traffic, that Chevrolet, after making that nose adjustment earlier this year, mandated by NASCAR, is not very good. Mike did the same thing Gordon did there last lap. Got the slippery stuff, but he's hanging on. So that debris is not as bad as, as the driver I was talking to this morning felt like it was going to be. If it was, had been bad, Mike Skinner, Robbie Gordon, both those cars would have spun out up that high. Here's Ford Burton, Daytona 500 winner in 22. Trying to put a pass on Mike Skinner in the four. Johnny Benson got damaged on the first pit stops when he and Jeremy Mayfield collided. Benson in the 10. Well, Skinner, I mean, even though they're racing back in the pack with about 20 a spot, there's so many cars there, he cannot get back to the bottom of the pack. And if you're out there by yourself on a straightaway, you've got two cars lined up underneath you, you're not going to out-drag them down the straightaway. Those two cars are going to run faster, nose to tail, than one car. You see both those cars made the pass, even with the damage on Johnny Benson's car. So that puts Mike Skinner back to 23rd place. Johnny Benson to 22nd, Ward Burton to 21st. 32 is Ricky Craven. One of the guys who did not stop in his last caution, Matt. And now he's dropped two positions since that restart. Now back down to eight, Mike Pinascucci. Listen to Ricky on the radio. There, you know, we really worked on his Todd Ford all day. You know, we closed shocks, open shocks. We're still 
still a little free in right now. We're going to have to next stop about lap 110. You know, we're going to have to tighten it up just a little bit more just to uh, see what we got. After finishing 31st, 34th, 16th, 17th, 34th, and 41st, he scored a ninth last year. He's trying to get his second straight top 10 here at the Brickyard this afternoon. And he buried that fun defender on the left front tire there. Getting into the corner, you see when Ricky Craven just hits the brakes a little bit. The front of that car really came down hard, and it looked like the tire is hitting on top of the fender well when he does that. All right, we talked about some guys. We've interviewed guys that could not make it. They've got to stop at least twice more for fuel. Mark Mark stopped this last time and topped off. Can he make it the rest of the way, guys? Well, Ben, let's talk to the tricky Ben Leslie. Ben, you did stop. Can you guys make it on one more stop? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's going to be tight. Five five or team has done a great job all day long, you know. Uh, it's going to be close. Jack does a great job on us uh, for fuel mileage. We'll just see how the cards play out. Ben Leslie scored his first career win as a crew chief in the Coca-Cola 600. Adam Hardy. Well, Matt, Kevin Harvick's crew chief is Gil Martin. Can you make it on one more stop? Yeah, I think a good race ever can make it in one more stop right now. We've put a set of tires on right there that's not agreeing with the car very much. We're pretty tight, so we'll pit sometime around 120 and 121 and make a go of it. Now, you would assume that his teammate, Robbie Gordon, who currently runs in second, could do the same. That is not the case. They think they're going to be about two laps short. Mark not only getting great fuel mileage, but his car is fast right now. Really fast, yes. Unfortunately, he lost that position of being the first car, the farthest forward car. That hit it. It can go on one more stop with Bill Jarrett passing it. Yeah, but I think he pulled out there. Oh, oh. trouble. Casey Atwood. Caution. Another driver's side impact into that safer barrier. Normally, at this track, the way these corners are laid out, if you get turned sideways getting into the corner, that's how you're going to hit the walls here at Indianapolis. And the sixth yellow flag of the Brickyard 400 will slow the field. You see Casey dropping the window net there as the safety workers are there. 62 laps to go. Now what do you do? Yeah, I was going to say, uh -huh. BP, I'm looking at BP with my hand up. like, all right, now what? Oh, you got to come in. Right? You're inside the window. Well, Bill Elliott and those guys that did not stop the last time, yes, they've got to stop. The guys that stopped earlier, no, they're not going to stop. They're going to stay on the racetrack, keep that track position, and stop one more time. This is turn one. Uh, Casey looks like he, he got in there underneath the eight car. Earnhardt looks like maybe lost a little of the air on the spoiler, and that happens here when you're running real close to another car. You're down on the inside. You lose the air on your car, which makes you loose. And I... And what happened when he got loose, he backed off the gas and Rudd ran the back of it. Right. See, as he chases it up the hill, I don't know, maybe Rudd, that angle doesn't show Rudd. The first thing we saw, I thought Rudd got in the back of him. But from that angle, I'm not sure. It looks like he just got the air off the spoiler, as Wally said. Well, let's see. Is there contact or not? Yeah, I think so. I saw the rear of the car come off the ground there, BP, so you're right. Casey has climbed from the car. And I tell you what, I applaud the Speedway for those safer barriers because that's a couple of times today, about three times we've seen cars make just heavy contact with the wall and all every time we've seen the driver get out of the car. Sure, they're heavy contact. It is heavy contact, but they're out of the car. Who pits? Who doesn't? Everybody. <laughs> I can't believe it. everybody's going to pit. Pit crews head-to-head -head here for track position. Oh. Matt Yoakum. We talked all morning before the race and also at the beginning of the race. It could all come down to what takes place on pit road. Dale Jarrett's in. Four tires and fuel. No adjustments at this juncture for Dale Jarrett. Meanwhile, Bill Elliott. Four tires and fuel. No adjustments. They did tell him the 31 car, Robbie Gordon, was running the same times as him. To Marty. Robbie is just a little bit loose, Matt. He, he said, I need to be a little bit tighter if I can, but I'm afraid to adjust it, so they decided to make no changes to it. It'll be a four-tire stop for Robbie Gordon, and he'll lose a lot of spots here on pit road. Bill. Uh, well, Jeff Gordon was on, or Jeff Burton was on pit road, took four tires, and he's gone. And I'm telling you, 
These guys, they all changed four tires. There's 61 laps to go. They've seen the last tire. They're going to get the rest of the day. Uh, sir, if that thing's truly really blowed up, we're on seven. We're going to stay out and lead a lap, okay? Okay. And that's exactly what they did. They stayed on the racetrack. They led a lap, got five bonus points, and then said, all right, let's bring it out and raise the hood and make sure that a plug wire hasn't jumped off. There's a problem. And Marty, what do they say down there? Well, let's ask Lee McCall. Lee, you got to look at the engine. What did you see? Uh, they really ain't nothing we can do for it. It's, uh, we think it's dropped the valve, but, um, you know, we had a good good run going, you know, with a course like Dodge. We were just a little bit tight and um, got stuck back in traffic there. Really wasn't making any progress, but uh, we're making progress on the car. So, you know, we were going to have a decent day, but unfortunately, uh, like I said, we dropped the valve here. We'll just uh, ride around here and collect as many points as we can. The hardest thing I had going on all day was uh, restarts on old tires when the tires were hot and uh, we'd come in for a fuel only stop or something like that and uh, tires had eight or ten laps on them and they just would pick up a lot of marbles, they'd pick up a lot of debris and I had a hard time keeping them clean enough and, and getting through turn one. I was just real loose through turn one and turn two on restarts and I would just, uh, I would lose, uh, sometimes I would lose two or three spots in restarts and it was tough to make that back up all day. Ricky Craven tries to drive to the inside of Newman. Jarrett looking for some running room. He goes by the 32 car on the outside, didn't he? Yes, he did. I think wow. we, I think Ricky gave way because Dale had had the angle into the corner. You know, saying back there in that. Whatever the reason, he did he did give those guys some room to get in there. Jarrett's coming. Okay, how about this? Ricky Craven's team gets its engines from Dale Jarrett's team. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. And a battle for third spot is Robbie Gordon at 31 car. Oh, he gets in the corner too deep. Can Mark get by? No. I'll tell you what, for having a fractured left heel, Robbie Gordon has driven a very fine race. Well, that last set of tires that Robbie got before this last pit stop, we watched the car through the corners, and the car looked as good as anybody. So they got the thing down where they want it right now. Are they back? Oh! Ooh. Almost some contact between the 99 and 12. Jeff Burton and the 99, 12, and Ryan Newman. Should be for 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and on back. And Dale Jarrett continues to move. Working past the lap car of Jimmy Spencer, now with Tony Stewart behind him. And Mark Martin, the next one ahead. Jarrett has finished in the top five in the NASCAR Winston Cup Championship in the last five straight years, driving for Robert Gates. His average start and finish in Indianapolis in eight races is 10th. Plus, he's won here twice. power as Matt Kenseth gets his yellow car moving toward the front. Kenseth from Cambridge, Wisconsin. And Todd Bodine still continuing to run well in that 26 car. He's on the inside of Spencer. He's in 10th spot now. Todd Bodine. Well, that carries a great illustration of just how fast you're going. 200 mile an hour at the end of the straightaways. Pretty fast. spot since the restart and Johnny Benson has taken his car to the garage area Remember his crew chief James Hintz, Benson's crew chief told us way back when he got damaged on that first pit stop that their day was ruined they were just riding around for points look at this some serious blocking going on back here is that Kevin Harvick yeah that's Kevin Harvick 29 Jimmy Johnston 48 and Rusty Wallace in the deuce. That's 12th, 13th. Rusty 14th. Blaine.
Blaney in the 77, the other car 15. And comes Parker. Here we go. There's some serious blocking now. It wasn't just Kevin Harvick and Jimmy Johnson. It's it goes on with all these drivers. They're going out there. They're getting everything they can every single lap. And if somebody's getting a run on you and you feel like that you can hold them off, you need to be trying to hold them off. If if you don't, you're going to lose a lot of positions. Whoa. Tony Storm goes by Robbie Gordon and just drives up right behind the six car. See those white gloves that Dale Jarrett wears? His fireproof racing gloves. Hand was working that steering wheel when he went under Mark Martin. As I, as I said earlier, oh, look at him just turn under that 24 oh, oh, sideways. That is loose. <laughs> Glove saving a beauty for Dale Jarrett at 185 miles an hour. That was big. Uh, air off the spoiler thing when he got under Gordon there. Yeah, he must have been because he just had so much momentum. He turned under there and he definitely got sideways. Mark Martin. Look at Mark do the same thing to Jeff Gordon. Come off the corner and just power up alongside the 24 car. But 24, he right. doesn't have the rubber these other two cars have right now. Right, no tires for him on that last stop. But guess what? I don't know how he can afford to get any, any tires the rest of the day because, trust me, these guys aren't going to put any tires on. Yeah. We're talking about Mark Martin. Bill, what are they saying down the 24 pit? Robbie Loomis, Jeff Gordon's crew chief, doesn't want to have to take tires, but may be forced to. And the situation is Jeff doesn't want to take two. They took fuel only last time for track position to get him in a situation where they could go on just one more stop. And the fact that they had to get out of all that traffic, which was making the car a handful to drive. It was a calculated gamble, looked good early, still doesn't look too bad. It all depends on whether or not we go green or get the caution. I don't know, Bill. I think not taking tires is going to maybe bite them in the end because right now he is sliding all over the racetrack. If he's got to go 50 laps on those tires, he's going to have his hands full. And he just mentioned that when somebody gets behind him, he jumps. Yeah, he had no choice, though, because he was in, in all that traffic and way too tight earlier. So they did the best thing they could do to get track position. Like I said, you had to either stay where you were or try to improve your position, and you never could stand still and which the cup race and you're getting back. Bill, Mike Ford is on the verge of possibly winning the biggest race of his career. A big decision earlier in the week to bring this race car that won at Pocono and also won at Homestead last fall to Indy. Right now, he's contemplating what strategy to play out in this final stop. Tires, no tires. Right now, Bill is happy with the car, but he did say there was some buildup on the tires. They're looking at the air pressure possibly in the front for the final stop. No changes on the 88 car. Dale Jarrett, former Brickyard 400 winner, since last 51. The car was a little bit loose. They did make a wedge adjustment. The car is eating, moving up to the front. He got into Ricky Craven on pit road. They were concerned about some possible damage, but the car is all right. Meanwhile, Mark Martin hasn't said a whole lot on the radio, trying to win the Brickyard 400 for himself and Jack Ross. Best finish here a second. And keep in mind, Mark Martin has never won the championship. He could win the Brickyard 400 and make a huge gain toward that dream since he Started the 1991 season, 348 races have been run. He's been the point leader at the end of only two. Tony Stewart runs in fourth, and he's pretty happy with the race car right now. They have said not much on the radio. The car has bounced back and forth, looking loose and tight all day long. They are talking about two tires, maybe no tires on the last stop, and he's made no mistake about it. This is the race he wants to win, Matt. Meanwhile, back in fifth is Matt Kenton, trying to overcome some bad luck here at the Brickyard, even been wrecked on pit road. The car was loose and made an air pressure adjustment to try to tighten up that 17 car. Bill. On the last pit stop, Jeff Burton took four tires. His crew chief, Frank Stoddard, put the setup back to where it was at the beginning of the race and loosened him up from there. Burton on the radio moments ago, cars getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Matt. Meanwhile, Brett, or Todd Bodine hasn't said a whole lot about that 26 car that's currently running back in the seventh position. They're looking at their final pit stop somewhere around lap 137 to 139. Bill. Well, this is what Wally was waiting for. I talked it over with the 24 bunch after Wally paraded me moments ago. They had no choice. They had to take fuel only. Even if they fall back to 10th or 12th or 13th, they're still, still six to seven spots ahead of where they were, and you can win from there if you get a break. Marty.
Robbie Gordon started this run a little loose off, and he's starting to push the longer he runs. He has never ran, led a NASCAR Winston Cup Series race here. He desperately wants to win at Indianapolis in any race car. About 20 more laps, and Robbie Gordon will be making his last stop of the day, Matt. Ricky Craven trying for a second straight top 10 finish here at the Brickyard. Trying for some consistency as well, as Crucci, Mike Beam told me they have done just about everything in that race car. Open up the shocks, close the shocks. The car was loose, but now that the car's in the top 10, Mike says, Ricky says, it's really come alive, Dave. Jimmy Johnson got four tires and a track bar adjustment on his last stop. It's better. He radioed in. I've got my line figured out. They radioed back. Well, don't wait till the end. Go get him. He's moved from 13th to 11th. Marty? Ryan Newman right now, the set of tires he's on, Dave, are scuff tires, meaning they've been run before. Next set will be stickers because Ryan does not like the set of his tires. Restarted fourth. He has fallen all the way down to the 12th position on the radio. Roger Pinsky is car owner, says, be patient. You still have a good car, and Roger should know he has won 12 Indianapolis 500s. Kevin Harvick following him on the racetrack. Kevin just a little bit tight out there right now. They were going to try the fuel strategy. It's not going to work. They are going to have to stop one more time no matter what. They were one of the few cars earlier that could go all the way. This team has put together three straight top tens looking for their fourth, Dave. Arnie, Rusty's boys had a busy stop last time. The car was tight. Four tires wedge in the right rear, a rubber out of the left rear, and they removed the tear off from the front. Bad news, the car is still tight. Marty? Steve Park sits in the 15th spot, and if he finishes there, this will be his best finish of the season. The indelible images from last week at Pocono of him flipping upside down. This is a great comeback for Steve Park. I talked to him this morning. He is talking to DEI President or Vice President Ty Norris, working on renegotiating his contract, maybe staying there for a few more years, Dave. Marty, earlier in the day, Dave Blaney's crew changed right side tires two times in a row. The first time it was okay, the second time very bad. They took on four. It helped the car. They took on four last time. Now they can play tire strategy at the end of the race, two or none. As for Bobby Labonte, former winner here at the Brickyard, he has gotten his car to the point to where they're only making minor changes on his car. Now it's very loose, but they put four tires on it, and it's back to where it was. He qualified and started 40th today. The car is running much better than it has all weekend long. Alan? Oh, Ricky Craven has got his hands full. Oh, he sure does. They lose in position after position. As a matter of fact, down in turn one, he's lucky he didn't lose the race car. That's like seven cars that just went by him. They were three wide down the front stretch and then a few more. Here comes Ward Burton to pass him. And he's still not at the speed. I don't know if something's happened to the car. He just lost his momentum down in the corner. So he was running 10th. Who is that? Ward Burton that just went by him. Now he's 18th, Matt. Matt, what's going on with the 32? Benny, he came on the radio and says, I think I may have a flat. I think I may have a rear tire going flat. So does he pit? Well, he can probably make it well. I don't know if he can make it the rest of the way or not. That's the problem. He's really in no man's land. He would love to run a couple more laps to be assured he can make it the rest of the way. That's probably what he's doing. He's got 37 laps to go in the race. And maybe he's just trying to get to his fuel window and then come in under the green flag. All right, so Craven continuing to struggle. And when that happens, if, if you think you have a flat tire, BP, a lot of times you'll, you have to have a lap or two try to feel it out because you don't want the thing to blow. So that looks like what he's doing right there. And while all that's been going on, you've missed not a thing at the head of the pack. It has been a red kind of day at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Bill Elliott has led 77 of the 124 laps that have been run so far. Yellow flag number seven in this race. Elliott Sadler with problems that have dropped debris on the speedway. Yep, right front tire. It's a big problem right there. It's got some damage on the left front fender as well. What's happening down there, Dave? Well, they came in and they changed that right front tire. Now, this is a weekend that had so much hope for Elliott after he had a great car at Pocono last week. He brought that same car to the Brickyard this weekend, thinking it would be perfect. It has not worked out that way. It's not run as well as they thought. And this just makes his day even longer, Wally. Okay. Yep, sure does. Maybe we can get a look at what happened. Right with Elliott. Looks like he just had that right front tire going down for a while. Right front flat, right front flat. 
And a bad break for Ricky Craven when the caution came out. He had made a green flag pit stop. And he now is caught a lap down by the yellow flag for Elliott Sadler's problem. We're going to have to come back in and either rip that off, that side skirt, or attach it back on somehow. All right, now, 33, there'll be 32 laps to go when the field comes to the start-finish line. We should see everybody pit here, and these will be the final stops of the race. That's right. How many will change two? How many will change none? How many will change four? Very interesting. The pit crews have been sitting in the 90-plus degree heat all day long. Now they have to put out a peak performance to try and get their man out in front, perhaps the winning track position at Indianapolis. Matt Yoko. Bill Elliott leads the parade down pit road for what could be their final pit stop today. Bill Elliott is in his race car, is a little bit tight. It's a six car, Mark Martin hits, and Dale Jarrett hits. A track, a wedge adjustment on the 88 car, Dale Jarrett, then pull the tear off. Two tire stop for Jarrett. A two tire stop for Mark Martin. Elliott, they were going to go with four tires, take a half a pound out of both front tires. And Dale Jarrett has a catch can hung in the back of his car. He's got to come back in. Oh, man. With all that, there's the can right there. BP's talking about being going to come back now, pit lane, take that can out, and he's going to lose all those spots. And the penalty for taking the pit equipment with him out of the pit stall, he's going to have to start at the end of the line on the restart that's going to put Dale Jarrett back in 33rd place. Oh, man. And here's a gentleman who had a race car that could have won this race. Well, I don't know. That might be a stretch to beat Bill Elliott, but he looked to be the class of the field after Elliott. Wiggle it. Wiggle it harder. I never see the gas man. The catch can is holding that gas can. They're making a chassis adjustment. Oh, whoa! Oh, no. They weren't expecting, I don't know that they were expecting him to leave like that. Because the, the gas man went back for the second can of fuel. Yeah. See, the catch, the catch can man was holding both the catch can and the fuel can. And something's wrong with Dave Blaney. He has a left side tire smoking as we see the catch can laying on the back stretch. Oh, that's frustrating. And Ricky Craven, that 32 car, by the way, starting in front of leader Mark Martin, tail end of the lead lap. Cars that separated him from the pace car are all pitted, so now he's the first one out in front of Mark Martin. He's a full two and a half miles behind as we go back to green. Ready. Green flag, buddy, green flag. See Ricky wiggling on the car there, too, and he probably, when he restarted, he probably spun the tires. And Jimmy Spencer looked like he got into the left rear of oh. Ricky. Check it out, Tony Stewart, down below the line on the apron, goes to the lead on Mark Martin. And looks like Raven may have a flat tire. He's very, very high down in one and two. And here comes Rusty Wallace for second spot. Harvey for third. Harvick looking to the inside of Mark Martin as they go to three. Rusty, Rusty, I'm sorry. Marty, those guys, the 20 pit crew got to be very excited right now. Well, the move paid off for Tony Stewart. He laid back on the restart on purpose. In fact, he almost laid back too much, Benny, because Rusty Wallace nearly passed him going into one. But it paid off because he had a lot of momentum when he hit turn two. That's how he passed Mark Martin. Oh, man, Rusty Wallace drove that two car down his turn one in incredibly deep, trying to stay in front of that 29 car. Well, they said to the two pit, Dave. Well, they're saying they want to get his first win here, obviously, which would be great. They took on two tires last time, still a little bit tight, air pressure and wet in the right rear to uh, help that car turn through the corners. And what about Bill Elliott, who's dominated the race so far and has the fresher tires? He's still back in fifth place. We opted for the four tires. When you have a fast race car, you can, you can stand to be a little conservative, and we know that our car was better with four tires, and we decided to do that and give up a few spots, but we knew it was a matter of time before we got back by him. Rusty Wallace putting pressure on Tony Stewart for the race lead. 25 laps to go. Rusty Wallace 
Morris has finished second in the Brickyard 400 on two different occasions, 1995 and 2000. He started this race in 35th place. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. There he goes. Probably where you see Rusty make the passes. Coming out of these corners in between the short shoot. If he can get underneath Tony, that's what he's going to try to do. Bill Elliott by Mark Martin to fourth. Right here. He stands on the gas and gets a bite. That's quite enough. But he's looking for the setup right now. Ricky Craven on the apron of the racetrack, leaving the pits, and here comes Rusty Wallace for the lead of the Brickyard 400. Got a little run in the draft on Stewart there, down the back stretch. St. Louis, Missouri's Rusty Wallace out in front at Indianapolis. The last time we took four, we made, you know, track bar and a tire pressure adjustment, plus we took some wedge out. And our whole plan was if the car was good enough and it would take the two tires, the last stop, and we could see our way to make it to the end, we were just going to get two tires and, and see what the track position, how that how that played out for us. And as it turned out, you know, we I really thought we'd end up running third or fourth, but he drove past all those guys and took the lead and, and, and held it for a while. And, and uh, it was, you know, that was our game plan, and it just worked out for us. I think we all realize Elliott is the guy that had to be update Dale Jarrett has picked up eight positions since the restart but he's only in his 20th and there's the gap from Jarrett up to leader Rusty Wallace while Bill Elliott closes in here's the race for fourth Kevin Harvick and Mark Martin Harvick, a native of Bakersfield, California. That is the hometown of Indy 500 four-time winner Rick Mears. It's just a matter of time, BP. Before Bill Elliott goes up and gets these guys. Yep, because he's about two-tenths, three-tenths of a second faster. And you see Tony Stewart <laughs> pointing, him, pointing him by. Is he pointing by or is he? Yeah, he is. Okay. Yeah. They, and Tony, and that's a smart move. Tony knows he's on four tires, so he knows he's not going to be able to stay in front of him. Gets up and messes with Rusty, they'll come back to him. You know what? <laughs> He's probably hoping that Elliot gets up and he and Rusty get together and he can win the Brickyard 400. Elliot's also thinking about getting second spot from Rusty because he knows if he gets around Rusty and if he puts Rusty in that high groove, Tony will be able to make up the time and maybe make up the pass. Well, no surprise, Bill Elliott's the fastest car on the racetrack that lap. Been that way about all day. I know it's getting close to college football season, but Go Big Red does not just stand for Nebraska football right now. I would guess some concern in the Elliott Pitts, Ray Everham teams. Jeremy Mayfield, his teammate, lost an engine in that 19 car. Exactly what happened, I don't know, but it has to be a little bit of a concern. Next Sunday, the road course at Watkins Glen for the NASCAR Winston Cup Series. 21 laps to go. Make it 20 as they come to the start finish line in this year's Brickyard 400. Matt Bill Elliott still closing in. Well, out a couple laps ago. In fact, I did ask Mike Ford. I said, Did you ever find out what was the culprit on the 19 car? He said, We'll focus on our own race. We don't care what happened to the 19 car. We just want to win this race. Remember, Ray Everman sitting on the box here in the ninth pit. Two time winner of the Brickyard as a crew chief, looking for his first win here as an owner. Yeah, there's not much you can do. You know, if you know what happened in the motor in the 19 car, there's not much you can do from the pit box. Change for position. Kevin Harvick overtaken for fourth. And maybe fifth as well. Yes, Kendall killed by for fifth. Mark Martin picking up a spot. His rival for the championship, Sterling Marlin. Remember, with that wounded engine, he's back in 31st place. Robert Gordon 
still hanging in there, but Rusty Wallace has got an absolute mirror full of Bill Elliott. And for all the talk about the youth movement in NASCAR Winston Cup racing this year, when it comes time for one of the sport's biggest races, it's the Wiley Old Veterans up front trying to settle things. Rusty Wallace, 45 years old, 1989 Winston Cup champion. Bill Elliott in that nine car, 46 years old, the 1988 series champion. And when you talk to the crew, to Mike Ford, to Ray Everham, the owner of the team, everybody on this nine team, and you mentioned Bill Elliott, they just, they cannot brag on him enough. Just what a tremendous job he's doing for them this year, driving this race car. And, and you know, and Ray says, Bill's having fun. He's fun to be around. He's having fun driving the race car. Even spread across the ages for race winners this year. And Bill Elliott is running very, very low down in the corners. Number one, he can do that because his car is handling well. Number two, it helps his car because he's able to at least get some air on that left front fender. Watch how low he goes. Rusty Wallace is two or three feet higher than he is. That allows some air to come back, get that left front fender, and give Elliott some downforce. Well, you got to run there. Now, you've been watching very intently, Wally, these last few laps. Any weakness there in Rusty Wallace's lap that Bill Elliott can exploit here? Only what Benny just pointed out, that, that he can run lower, getting into the corner. He gets his left side tires down right almost on the grass, and Rusty's running a little bit higher. Eventually, he'll wear Rusty out, and he'll be able to turn the car underneath Rusty and get up beside him. See, there you can see it's four or five feet that time, and each time that he does that, he gets a tremendous run on Rusty Wallace off these corners. Jeff Gordon started 27th and one here last year. Rusty Wallace took the green flag in 35th place today. Want to keep an eye on this battle for the lead in case Elliott pounces, but we'll let you know Mark Martin has started falling back. He's no longer in fourth position. He slipped back to 16th place. Matt, what's up there? Alan Sterling Marlins hitting the points may not be as bad as he thought. Mark Martin came on the radio and said, I've got something wrong with the car, possibly an engine problem. I asked Jack Roush, what is the problem? He said, we just don't know. He's fading and fading fast. I ran a more conservative gear than, than uh, the rest of my teammates ran. Um, um, you know, talking to motor guys before the race started, or, or actually before Saturday started, I knew what they wanted to turn for RPMs. And I knew what gear we had to run to not go over that. And them guys uh, ran a little bit more and were turning more RPMs than, than I think what uh, uh, the motor guy wanted to see. And, and I think it was just too much. I'm trying to think, you know, we've had a, one of these races played out just like this before, and I'm thinking it was the 96 race that Dale Jarrett won when he was chasing Ernie Irvin, his teammate. They ran like this. The two cars, nose to tail, nose to tail, looked like Ernie was going to win the race, and then Ernie had one slip, and Jarrett pounced and ended up scoring the victory. Was that when Ernie had the flat tire going down in turn one? Yeah, but I think that was because they hit each other in uh, a short shoot. Right. Yeah, I think Dale passed them. They, they, Ernie slipped, and Dale got underneath him. How about Rusty, Dave? Well, remember all day, guys, he's been complaining of the tight condition in that car, and, I, you know, that would that would uh, account for his line through the corners, wouldn't it? If he was just a little bit tight still, he would run a little bit higher than Bill Elliott, would he not? Yeah, that would have a lot to do with it. I, I think probably being cleaner air, maybe he's starting a little bit better right now, but, but you're right, Dave, he's running a little bit higher, may not be able to get that car turned down that low. Rusty Wallace holds the distinction here at Indianapolis of leading the most laps in a race that he did not win. He led 110 laps of the race two years ago, wound up finishing second. Last year he started 37th, finished fourth in the Brickyard 400. Today he's run up from 35th to the lead, but he's got the dominant driver of the day on his back bumper, putting a lot of pressure on. You know, the problem with Bill Elliott, right? We talked earlier, very early in the show about aerial push, aerodynamic push. Getting behind the car and not being able to get all the air on the nose of the car to push it down and help it turn. And Elliott's in that very situation right now because he's running about two tenths of a second slower now than he was when he was in front because he just, that arrow push has got it. 
He's on him now. Yeah. But, you know, you're right, Benny, and also it looked like Rusty moved down lower on the racetrack. Maybe maybe to do that. Maybe to break some of the air behind him. See if he does it here in one or two. No, he can't get down there in one or two, but before he was real low. <laughs> Mark Martin has fallen back to 21st place now, by the way. His crew, Matt Yoakum, tells us from Pippo, telling him to switch to the backup ignition, so he continues to struggle. Yeah, Benny, he caught him quick, and then he's right at that gap. What are we talking about? He can't close that gap because of that push, that arrow push. And Bill's doing all he can. He's going just as low as he possibly can to get some air down there, to get some downforce, but it isn't quite enough. Rusty Wallace trying to win one of NASCAR's biggest prizes in a very storied career, Bill. Boy, you're not kidding, Alan, and he's been thinking about this day for a long time because they tested very well here and did not take the car they tested here last week to Pocono. If you talk to the guys on Rusty's team, they circled dates this year, dates where they wanted to be in certain places on the racetrack and in the points. One of them was here, but now he's going to give up the lead. Here comes Bill Elliott looking for the lead at Indianapolis down the backstretch. But Russ is going to drive it in there. I don't. Is he going to back off? No, he has to. He has no choice. Elliott in front. Listen to the fans as Bill Elliott retakes the lead. And I tell you what, Bill Elliott just broke Rusty Wallace's heart right there. Stay after Jarvis. Big day for us right here. Just keep after. Blue Chief and Rusty Wallace. Hey, Rusty hung in there, though, on those two tires. Fifth, was it 15 times Bill Elliott has been voted most popular driver in NASCAR? By the fans. The redhead from Dawsonville, Georgia. Wasn't a couple of years ago that Bobby the Bonnie did exactly the same thing to Rusty Wallace? Passed him with just a few laps to go. Dave. All right, Dave. And Benny, one of his crew members, looked at me as we were watching the monitor down here, and he said, same thing as it was with Bobby Labonte, just shaking his head. <laughs> Bill Elliott's team has prepared an excellent race car. They have been dominant all day long. Watch their reaction as he made the pass on Rusty Wallace. <laughs> go! Go, Bill! Out of boy! Better than him. <laughs> Think he's not still competitive? You know, I went to the dentist a couple of weeks ago and I was sitting there and all of a sudden the voice said, open wide. And I looked and I turned around. The voice didn't sound right. Ray Everham was in the room next door to me. They had given him a blue apron and he came in with the fork and the, <laughs> the whole nine yards. And now that Elliott's gotten out in front, he's pulling away from Rusty. And that's not a surprise. You talked about the arrow push on Elliott's car while he was behind Rusty. Now that he's in clean air. Yeah, now, he, now that he's in clean air, he's about three tenths of a second quicker. Because he's got that grip back on the front of the car that's helping him turn. And he didn't have when he was following the two-car Rusty. A good day for Todd Bodine for a while is over. He has just taken the Discover Card machine to the garage. Elliott Sadler is also taking the Wood Brothers car into the garage. Where's Dale Jarrett? Remember, he restarted back in 28th place. He's picked his way to 12. That's very, very impressive. Yeah. Another one whose Indianapolis dreams have been broken here today. He has had the pleasure of getting his name inscribed on the trophy featuring the famous brick. He was in position. He probably, probably had the strongest car to challenge Bill Elliott. After that last run there before those pit stops, he was flying. Looked like he might have had the strongest challenge to Bill Elliott since Tony Stewart in the early laps, you know. But a pit stop mistake. Put a damper on their hopes for a breakout 400 win. Caution. Oh, that's what Elliott needs to see, huh? Caution flag is out with eight laps to go. And that's what Jarrett wanted to see. Debris on the racetrack. Well, what a big break for Dale Jarrett. That lets him catch up with 
because he's in 12 spot and he conceivably conceivably in a couple laps could pick up four or five spots as fast as his car is where it is debris is in turn number two of this racetrack and so we're going to reload for a real short sprint to the finish we showed you ray Evernham's reaction to bill elliott taking the lead how about the crew's reaction to this caution flag coming out i'm sure it's quite different yeah that's Mike Ford, the crew chief. Man, oh man, don't hurt yourself, Mike. <laughs> and race it on, heck with it. All right, now, when the pace car leads the field to the opening of Pitt Road, there's going to be six laps to go. And 30 cars on the lead lap. That's I guess there's the debris that uh, back straight away. Four laps to go in the Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Bill Elliott has led 88 of the 155 laps that have been run. But if he can't lead these final four, it'll all have been for naught. See the cone on pit wall on the inside? Down here, that is the restart point. When Bill Elliott gets there... Go, go, go. I think he was a little early, but the green flag is waving. And a good jump for Elliott on Rusty Wallace. I had told him on the radio, I said, remember, Jeff Gordon won this race last year on restart. You know, Sterling bobbled a little bit, missed a shift, or didn't take off good, and Jeff got by him and won the race. And, uh, you know, I think if we could have got by him, we may have held him off five or six laps for a win. Ward Burton on pit road for an unscheduled stop as the field motors on. 14 more corners for Bill Elliott. Wow. He had that figured out ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> had my calculator smoking. Steady as she goes, those hands on the wheel. That's just got to be a race car driver's dream to have a car that performs as well as this one has all day. Especially in a place like this. And he's run that car on the bottom all day long, and that's it. That is the key here. Tony Stewart about to lose a couple of spots. There goes Harvick and Ryan Newman alongside. And here goes Newman on the inside of Harvey. Fourth place. And Newman's going to get it for now. Steve Park. Yeah, where'd he come from? And here comes Jeff Gordon on the inside of both of them. Tony Stewart, who started the day on pole position. He's getting shuffled back in the field. There's something wrong with Tony's car right now. I don't know exactly what. It's like he's got a tire going flat or something. Well, he had Steve Park on his bumper going through four there, and I'm sure it was making him real loose there, but he is falling back a lot in spots. Nice day for Steve Park after that terrible crash one week ago at Pocono. They were fairly calm, though. Ray was on the box. He's not usually on the box with us, and uh, he was he was kind of jittery, which was funny to watch, but uh, you know, they were pretty calm. You know, anything can happen with, with a few laps left. You still... You still try and stay focused and, and uh, try and win the race, and that's what we did. And now it's down to one lap for Bill Elliott at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Down the main straightaway, 275,000 fans looking on as Elliott rides through the canyon of grandstands and takes the white flag. Final lap of the Brickyard 400. sports most popular drivers ever Elliot looking for career victory number 43 and his first here on these hallowed grounds he's dominated the race today he will have led 93 of 160 laps now he's one corner away from an Indianapolis winner's trophy of the Brickyard 400 in Indy. A 
dominating victory for Dodge at the Brickyard. Elliott wins by 1.2 seconds over Rusty Wallace. And look at Bill, got that win and that down, acknowledging those fans. Well, I think it's this particular car, you know, really Sterling was the dominant car last week. I think the racetrack went away from him a little bit there at the end, and we were able to put it together and put the path on him to win. But today, the guys had it together. I mean, we, we came here and tested and ran so hard for two days, and that's what paid off to bring us in, in victory lane here today. Here's how they ran today at Indy. Elliott with his second straight win on the Winston Cup circuit. Rusty Wallace has to settle for second here again. Third time he's finished as the runner-up in this race. As we check 11 through 20, Rip, look, all these cars still in the lead lap. Tony Stewart wound up 12th after his problems in the closing laps. Dale Jarrett wound up 10th, by the way. Mark Martin and Sterling Marlin, championship duo, both had problems today, wound up 27th and 28th. And look, all these cars are still in the lead lap. We get to 31st and we see Jimmy Spencer, the first car, a lap down. He tried all day to get that lap back, never could. Championship standings, new second place runner after today's action in Indy. Jimmy Johnson has moved into second. Mark has lost a spot. Rusty Wallace gained three spots. Elliott three. And Kurt Busch lost five spots with that crash over turn three.